Well, hello and welcome to volume 13 of Drink the Music. I am Brian here as always with Michaela. Um, and Michaela, today we're going to be talking about a uh, sophomore album, the second album, and unfortunately the last album uh, that we got from the one, the only Miss Amy Winehouse. So today we're talking about Back to Black. Uh, how are you doing, Michaela? Are you excited to dig into Amy Winehouse, her story, and uh, this album that uh, kind of came out of nowhere, uh, at least here in the United States, and blew everyone away and uh, got us all got us all into those jazz clubs uh feeling feeling that soulful soulful tune yeah yeah i i i'm actually really excited uh about this my my husband's a huge fan of amy winehouse oh my god um and she, for a long she time, might be the was, only person from london that uh that your husband that, that anthony likes yeah that's that's probably true actually um that's probably true uh she you know she kind of came out on the scene uh, in a really weird way in America. I, I, I wasn't in England at the time. Um, but so I, I can't speak for that, but I remember all of a sudden everyone was singing rehab, like everyone, <laughs> every, mm -hmm. it was, it was on every karaoke list. It was in every bar. It was, um, it was on commercials. It was just everywhere. And it was like, what is, what is up? And I remember, um, when it came out, I think I had just finished, uh, I'd finished college and I, it was in my like second year of like my big girl job. And all the women were like getting ready to go out to the club and stuff, singing the song rehab. And I was like, who is this person? <laughs> and so, um, that's the first time I remember. And then of course the hairstyle, right. Of the big, mm -hmm. this, like mm -hmm. beehive, bouffant but it was like a way sexier beehive because it was half up and half down and you know kind of i don't know it was like a goddess like this grecian i don't know almost italian a little a little sultry a little sultry yeah yeah you know mm -hmm. and with the mm -hmm. eyes every uh, yeah there's so much there's so much that now we think about amy winehouse but really she was just a girl who loved to sing she was just a girl who loved to sing. Absolutely. So Amy Winehouse was born in London um, in 1983. Uh, she spent most of her childhood in and out of various performing arts schools um, and then finally would get herself a guitar at age 14 and start uh, writing her own songs. Um, she ultimately ended up being the lead vocalist for the National Youth Jazz Orchestra. I'm um, not from the UK myself, but that sounds like a pretty big deal. I don't know. Uh, let us know if you're fans of the uh, National Youth Jazz Orchestra out there. But yeah, sounds like a big deal. Um, it's going to get her landed with Simon Fuller, you know, the American Idol guy, uh, his talent management company in 2002. Uh, she would go on to get her record deal with EMI and release her first album, Frank, in 2003. Uh, Frank's a little bit more of a jazz centric album, uh, but it does ignite this fire that would burn hot, bright and fast. That was Amy Winehouse. Yeah, it's really weird. And and I, I we're talking about Back to Black, but I do think that it's really interesting because you're right. I mean, Frank was her first album and it was really much more focused on the jazz. This this Back to Black had two producers um that kind of co combined these different um these different sort of song um creation techniques. I'm not a producer, so I'm sure there's a better more technical term for that, but the way that they created this like jazzy Motown um and the way that 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 kind of riveted across the world um, in a way all of a sudden she was at every festival. She was singing songs with Mick Jagger at La Isle of Wight. She was, uh, you know, she just completely kind of steamrolled everybody's hearts and ears. And um, it, it was, again, it's such a shame that we don't get, that we're not going to get any more of her music because uh, truly a, a talent. And, when you think about maybe the darkness in which she was feeling and and the dark spaces she was in and the the struggles that she had um it's 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 amazing that uh, it's 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 so incredible that she was able to shine so bright and reach so high um if if we had just been able as a, as a world to kind of help um help her through that it, there's no telling what would have what would have been um so it's it's a really a very bittersweet album back to black to listen to now um i feel like um i don't know what your thoughts are on that brian but yeah, for sure. And uh, yeah, it definitely takes on a whole new meaning, you know, following her death in uh, 2011, uh, for sure, you know, um, and that's that's one of these things about uh, these uh, these musicians who uh, fly high and uh, into the sun. And we're going to talk about that when we get into the album. But first, Michaela, we're going to uh, need to uh, mix up a cocktail. This is apparently one of Amy's favorites. So let's go ahead and take a quick break and we'll be right back to uh, mix up this week's drink. So, Brian, 
you found this drink because you went looking for what Amy Winehouse liked to drink. And I am amazed. I, when you told me the ingredients to this, I mm-hmm, mm-hmm. was really hesitant. Hesitant is not the right word. Disgusted is probably more of the word because it's got banana Fair. liqueur in it, which I know you Delicious. love. You love Delicious. banana. You think banana is amazing. You yes. add that to Bailey's Irish cream. I'm sold. I'm in. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then you yeah, add yeah. vodka. All right. I'm okay. Then you add Southern Comfort, and I'm done. This sounds totally <laughs> nasty, but but uh, but after putting it together, um, I'm I'm surprised to say that this was actually all right. It was actually all right. That's right. Yeah. So this cocktail is called the Rixtasy. It comes. Uh, the recipe here comes from uh, cocktail.uk. Um, and apparently this was a cocktail that uh, Amy Winehouse liked to have at her uh, local uh, pub, the Holly Arms uh, in Camden. There's so she would go in and uh, get these all the time. And there's a really good article I found um, from Vice uh, that talks about the Holly Arms uh, Camden pub and, you know, kind of kind of likens it almost to like a like an old French, like like poetry den kind of thing, because all of these um, up and coming uh, like uh, rock and roll stars were hanging out there and spending time there and, uh, you know, collaborating and talking together. So that article is pretty interesting. So I'll go ahead and put a link to that down in the show notes for sure. But uh, let's get this cocktail mixed up and then we're going to talk a little bit about it so basically into a glass with some ice uh you know this this is a pub nothing nothing too fancy here so uh put in a one and a half ounces of vodka a half ounce of bailey's a half ounce of banana liqueur and a half ounce of southern comfort give that a stir uh and sip away and you're good to go um now, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about Southern Comfort here, Michaela. That's a, you know, that's a ingredient that people are kind of familiar with, but maybe not sure exactly what it is. Um, do you have much experience with good old SoCo from New Orleans way? So I do. I, <laughs> I'm i embarrassed to say I thought it was a whiskey for the longest time. People would be like, oh, I love Southern Comfort. And I'd be like, yeah, that's I mean, a whiskey. Kind of. Kind of, kind of, right? It kind of. Yeah. I mean, it's a dark liqueur. Um, or Sorry, it's a dark liquor. It's not, I wouldn't say it's a liqueur. Um, but I remember it sounds so good. Like Southern Comfort. It sounds like being wrapped in a warm blanket. Um I have to say yep. it's it's not quite how it tastes. <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of how it tastes. It kind of how is how it tastes. So Southern Comfort is pretty old, Michaela. Uh, it was uh, first uh, invented, I guess, in uh, like 1874. And kind of the original uh, recipe for this here was uh, basically you're taking your bourbon and you're adding some vanilla bean, some lemon, cinnamon stick, cloves, a couple of cherries, an orange, uh, and you you kind of let that soak, right? And then uh, you're gonna strain that stuff off, and you get uh, Southern Comfort. Now Southern Comfort uh, would uh, kind of close down during uh, Prohibition here, and then you know kind of be reborn into you know more modern day uh, Southern Comfort. But yeah, it's still kind of just like the spiced. Uh, you know, whiskey uh, basically is what it is. And it still has kind of those same kind of notes, you know, some cinnamon, some like cherry, some orange uh, kind of flavors in there. Um, I'm mostly familiar with it because like a like a Southern Comfort and Coke, like a SoCo and Coke is a, a pretty popular like college staple. So I remember having those, uh, you know, periodically throughout my college days. And um, yeah, it's still real big in uh, New Orleans. If you're down there getting some cocktails, you're going to see Southern Comfort on a lot of bar menus. You're going to see lots of bottles of it uh, sitting around there for sure. Yeah, I definitely uh, recommend if you're gonna if you're gonna go to New Orleans, um, have some Southern Comfort there a- and a Sazerac. Do that. Um, but yeah, this this one was a uh, this concoction was a little interesting to me. It was uh, it's a little bit on the sweet side. I was really worried about the banana. I got to tell you because mm, I'm yeah, not yeah. a huge banana liqueur fan. I know you love it, but it was I was real concerned. Um, I made this uh, late last night and um, it sat real nice, actually. Uh, And I don't know, maybe it's the cherry. I didn't realize some Southern Comfort had some cherry in it. Um, But maybe that was the extra sweetness because the Irish cream is sweet, but it wasn't um, this wasn't syrupy, but it had this kind of interesting viscosity that reminded me of, of kind of a maraschino maraschino being kind of quality to it. And and I'm wondering if that's because of the sweetness that was inherently in the Southern comfort. Yeah. It has kind of like a, like a candy quality to it. It's not like mm. a, like a syrupy sweet, but more of like a, like a hard yeah. candy uh, kind of yeah. thing going on to it maybe. Um, and it's, it's almost like a faux like white Russian kind of there with the, uh, the Bailey's and the vodka. Yeah. Um, I did, th- I did think that the, the vodka for me made it a little bit hot. I probably would dial that back to like one ounce of the vodka, um, instead of the ounce and a half. If I was going to make, 
mix this uh, up again, but I like this flavor combination actually. And yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't sure how the, the Southern comfort and the, the banana were going to going to pair up, but I thought that it was pretty good. If you like, like banana, you definitely get some banana notes from that. And, you know, kind of that, that candied orange kind of thing that you're getting from Southern comfort. So uh, this was pretty interesting, uh, pretty good. So give it a try. Let us know what you think about the, uh, the Ricks to see, and let us know if you've ever made your way into Camden to the Holly arms. We'd love to know that and see pictures of that. But uh, for now, Michaela, we've got this mixed up. So why don't we do this? Let's take a quick break and we'll be right back to chat about Amy Winehouse's Back to Black. All right, Michaela. So today we are talking about Back to Black from 2006 by the one, the only uh, Amy Winehouse. And it gets started right off the top with that uh, that banger, right? The one that uh, first got basically all of America introduced to uh, Amy Winehouse. Now those songs from Frank would eventually kind of drip out. But I think rehab is where everyone's getting their education, at least here in the United States, about Amy Winehouse, right? Um, this yeah. is a... This is a pretty autobiographical song about, uh, you know, Amy's uh, refusal to enter rehab at the request of her former record label. Um, it was her only song to breach the top 10 here in the U.S. Billboard charts, but it was responsible for three Grammy wins. That's pretty good. Three wins off of that one song there. Uh, strong Motown vibes here to uh, get us started off. And, you know, it's uh, certainly a glimpse into you know, the inner demons that played Amy Winehouse at the time. Uh, but I think it's also kind of a look at the codependency she was having uh, in her relationship that most of Back to Black covers. Um, I just need a friend. Um, the song, um, you know, at the outset, right in 2006, the song is empowering and anthematic. And then, you know, unfortunately, you know, by the time, you know, 2011 comes around, uh, the song turns very tragic. Yeah, it's it's interesting to me. I mean, Mark Ronson has talked about it in interviews uh, around this since since Amy's death and said, you know, look, at the time of making of this album, you know, Amy wasn't using any any drugs and she seemed clean and, um, you know, the future seemed really bright. I mean, obviously, the record label was still. Um, you know, we can talk about record politics, but, you know, they're still trying to get their money out of out of these the, this, this artist. Right. Who's mm -hmm. <laughs> actually in the midst of real pain and, and trying to get healthy. So, um, you know, I have my feelings about that. But um, I loved the rehab song because what it, it said to me then and it still says to me now in a way which is i i don't actually need to go to rehab i just need to listen to my music and my my how therapeutic the music is she talking about being at home with ray and mr hathaway and how those things those those people are going to soothe her and at first i was like what are we talking about and then i you know thought about it a little bit more and you know i personally find a lot of um therapy in listening to some of my favorite you know list songs and and you know we talk about how how i love joni mitchell i mean when you're in a dark place sometimes these songs and these things will will be like a friend and like listening uh to someone kind of help you through a, a dark time and i really uh that's the, that's what i cling on to when i when i listen to rehab now is is um even though it's very pop it's, it's kind of bluesy and it's got this jazz um you know rendition that kind of belies the darkness uh, underneath. Um, that's kind of where I go when I think about it now, because really, um, I like to think of Amy as saying, I don't need that because now I've, I've got this great music and I can just, I, I, that's what, mm -hmm. that's, what's going to heal me. Not, not eight weeks of rehab and who has the time for that anyway, kind of thing, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, we get into track number two, then, uh, you know, I'm no good. It's a little bit more, uh, bluesy sounding here. There's some drums and bass guitar that gets us start up into this, uh, soulful, uh, kind of nightclub ballad, uh, sort of thing. I can, you know, imagine Amy standing in front of a piano in a dark club at singing this one. Um, and it's a very sultry, uh, sounding song and it's a telling of, uh, kind of the, the point of view from Amy of being a bad, uh, rom romantic partner. Um, you know, I cheated myself like I knew I would, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of this album that's coming from the point of view of Amy of, you know, being uh, being, you know, not necessarily a bad person, but just, you know, kind of accepting and acknowledging the fact that, you know, you're probably not not the right fit for these people that you're uh, chasing down. Yeah, I, I love the horn section in this one. Um, it's just mm -hmm. magnificent. So this is where I think th this was the first I, I when you listen to this in order, this is the first time I feel like we're really introduced to the greatness of the Dap Kings because you get this amazing horn section. Um, it feels like they're performing in this really dark, out of the way jazz club. Um, and she's just kind of burying, you know, her her mirrored soul on stage for us saying, you know, it's very self-reflective of knowing that you're not you're not good um, or that you're in a 
bad way or you're going to continue to make bad decisions. Um, it is very sultry too. So it's, uh, you know, Amy Winehouse had a way of being vulnerable and also like real barbed wirey where you, 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 they, she, you mm-hmm. know, it was like, I'm going to show you vulnerability, but you're never going to be able to get there. And you're never going to actually be able to hurt me, even though I'm going to show you how hurt I am. It was really special. Yeah, it was really special. Um, and you mentioned kind of those uh, those uh, doo-wop vibes there from the from the Dap Kings. That's what we're getting back to here a little bit on Me and Mr. Jones, track three. Um, this is a song about her relationship with Nasir Jones, uh, who is uh, an R&B artist uh, commonly known as Nas. Uh, apparently, this was one of her favorite songs to report to perform live and i kind of like this it has kind of like this dinner theater uh jazz uh troop kind of jazz band kind of thing kind of feeling going on here and you know it's uh sort of playful and uh sort of tumultuous at the same time you know we're over but maybe i'll let you make it up to me uh is you know is the lyrics here and the vibe here right (laughs) we're done but you know maybe he can get back in my good graces i don't know mr jones yeah, I don't know. I uh, love this song because it's the first time for me uh, listening to it in order where we really see some of the vocal range that um, Amy Winehouse has. I mean, she has an amazing voice and it's very, it, it you know, it gets up there. People compare her to Ella Fitzgerald. Um, you know, Jim Wigmore has been compared uh, t- to her voice. Billie Holiday, Nina Simone, all of these really just uh, unique sounding voices, but this mm-hmm. one I really love. Kind of some of the trills that she does, and some uh, some of the way she she kind of utilizes her range. Um, and apparently, this was one of the favorites, one of her favorite songs that she would like to do live. Um, and I get I get why listening to it because it's pretty impressive. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, yeah, it definitely as as sultry as she wants to make that one. Uh, so I could see that one being, you know, fun to uh, to perform live for sure. Uh, gets us into track four, Just Friends. Uh, this has a little bit more of a churning kind of jazz tune uh, going on here. And, you know, Amy is just asking, is it possible to just be friends? Uh, one thing that's uh, kind of apparent to me, at least, uh, about Amy kind of kind of through her life and the uh, lyrics here in this album and, and uh, Frank, you know, that, you know, kind of in addition to Amy Winehouse having her own kind of addictive tendencies um, I think that she understood that she herself was probably very addictive to to men and fans and um you know these relationships and things like that. And I think she's kind of realizing, you know, kind of the kind of the power and responsibility that that uh represents to her there, right? With great great power comes great responsibility. And I think she's she's kind of understanding that, you know, that that people will mm-hmm. fall head over heels for her here in the song Just Friends. Um and I really love kind of those the lines here in those lyrics. Uh no, I'm not ashamed, but the guilt will kill you um if she doesn't first, because I'll never love you like like her. I'll never love you like she does oh yeah that's uh that's real hard (laughs) um again the horn section is really a a driving force for this one i can't believe i'm talking about the music and you're talking about the lyrics this is kind of a just position uh to believe to believe it or not i know oh it's only been 10 weeks jesus um yet um the piano here and the guitar components really um really do it for me as well as, as the lyrics. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of where Amy's voice goes with this. I think it's kind of an offbeat vocal track to me, but mm-hmm. I really love, uh, I love the lyrics. I think they're, they're really hard. Um, especially as somebody who has a lot of, a lot of friends, uh, of the opposite sex. It's, it really is. It is interesting being, thinking about that in the way that maybe in the context of Amy Winehouse. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody could actually be just friends with Amy Winehouse. If she didn't yeah. want them to be just friends, you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 That's right. That's right. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's, that's kind of examining that. And then uh, track number five uh, is, is the big one here um, off the album in, in terms of, I guess, uh, notoriety, uh, maybe in, in songwriting and uh, lasting legacy, but that is track number five back to black. This is the 79th best song of all time, according to Rolling Stone. And this song leaves uh, Amy Winehouse going black after her relationship with her uh, boyfriend ends that she's talking about here this uh uh what's his what's his name uh blake fielder civil that she's writing about here right you go back to her and i'll go back to black um it's uh 
probably the most hauntingly beautiful breakup songs uh, of all time, or of, at least of all all of these. And uh, it's got to be up there uh, kind of all time, uh, for sure. Um, and I really like kind of the the way that this song is set up. And there's like this little bridge section where basically the tempo uh, kind of drops out. Most of the instrumentation uh, drops out. And it's just Amy Winehouse kind of, uh, you know, breathlessly saying, singing, uh, you know, black. It's just kind of hanging in the air uh, over that. And, you know, obviously uh, kind of similar to, to Rehab, right? Uh, you know, uh, it kind of feels different, you know, after uh, after her death than it did at the, at the time. But a uh, very haunting, very beautiful song, Back to Black. Back to Black. I I have to say, I mean, I, I liked Rehab, but this song is, to me, quintessential Amy Winehouse all day. This is her, in my opinion, her crowning achievement. Um, there is a great story, Mark Runson, uh Am I saying his? I hope that I'm saying his name right. Mark Ronson had uh, he was the producer for half of this album, and he she went into this back room to kind of write the words. He had sent her kind of the the track to to think about. She comes out with a napkin that he still has to this day. It's got like heart emojis. It's got a phone number on it. Like it's a this ratty kind of piece of paper, and it has these lyrics. Um, we only said goodbye with words. I died a hundred times, and as a producer, it really bothered him that they didn't rhyme. He was like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if that's going to work, a- Amy. And she just looked at him. She wouldn't, uh, she wouldn't even respond. She's like, what do you, what do you mean? I'm, I'm not, I'm not rewrite. This is the song. I'm not rewriting it. This is it. And I got to say, like, as a producer, maybe that's a valid thing. I don't know. I've never been a music producer, but mm-hmm. as a listener, holy God, it's so good. Like, yeah. You don't mind you, the way her voice just kind of cracks when she says times and she does it in in only like the the third bar, the third time she sings it. Um, oh, it's so heartbreaking. And you just want to scoop her up and, you know, make sure that like sh- she's OK, because it's obvious that she's falling into these pieces, into this black hole and um just the most amazing, just the most amazing track on this album, for sure. For me personally, it's definitely is the crown and glory of it. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's a couple of songs here that are, you know, just kind of elevated, you know, above, you know, being really good to being great. And Back to Black is probably uh, the tops up there. Uh, so we've got one more song here before our album break, Michaela. Track number six, Love is a Losing Game. So we've got uh, three verses here. It's kind of a, a more cathartic look at the love that you've lost, you know, Back to Black is kind of speaking of depression, you know, kind of when that on that breakup. But Love is a Losing Game is uh, kind of a more coming to terms uh, kind of thing that the relationship is over. Um, there's no real like chorus here. It's got like these three verses. Uh, so the strong structure itself is kind of um, interesting. Um, and really, it's just kind of the last line of each of those three verses that kind of rhyme uh, that tie this thing together. Uh, there's a lot of metaphor going on here, you know, gambling and uh, closing nightclubs and stuff like that. And it's a slower paced, more uh, soulful sounding songs than, you know, Back to Black, which is a little bit more, you know, kind of a aggressive uh sounding and then tears dry on their own which is a little bit more aggressive sounding so it's it's a little bit more solemn i think yeah it kind of reminds me if we picked up las vegas like old vegas and we put it in the middle of motown right yeah. uh that's kind of what it reminds me of because you can almost hear the closing down and the the clubs darkening but it's it's very nostalgic in that way yeah it is absolutely and um now that we're getting into the album uh break here i think that's that's uh probably a good that kind of you know reminded me i wanted to to bring up michaela you know amy winehouse um seemed like she would have been you know as comfortable performing in some one thousand dollar a plate uh jazz uh you know dinner function kind of thing or like the diviest of dive bar you know old vegas you know fancy new vegas uh in the in the sphere where tickets are a thousand dollars you know or you know going you know somewhere on the uh the old strip uh something like that she seemed like you know kind of kind of her voice and musical stylings and attitude would have been, you know, as comfortable in either of those places. And I think that that is uh, one of the things that's really telling about Amy Winehouse and uh, kind of her popularity and uh, her massive amounts of talent. So, um, Michaela, the first album, Frank, you know, is a smash hit definitely in the UK. Um, not not so much here, right? We didn't really know of of the album Frank um, really until after this came out. And then we're like, oh, we should probably also check out Frank. But there were some of those songs that were uh, starting to uh, trickle into the US, right? Valerie and um, F Me Pumps mm-hmm. and uh, stuff like that. So, um, but, you know, Amy Winehouse is, you know, kind of this uh, 
uh, super talented, super sultry, you know, bringing that jazz lounge act uh, back to the world. And everyone's like, wait, who, who, who is Amy Whitehouse? Where, where did she come from? What is this? I, I don't even understand. It was so uh, new and unique and revolutionary. So uh, final uh, following up to Frank, this is the second and final album uh, here back to black for Amy Winehouse. There was a posthumous uh, compilation called Lioness uh, that came out after her uh, death. So you can go seek that one out too. Um, so Amy, basically, she'd kind of prime the pumps so to speak with frank right getting getting kind of this sound uh, out into the world and getting people ready so then when you know back to black came out people went absolutely nuts for it right it was a, a huge huge deal uh nominated for six grammys it won five uh which is tied uh tied amy winehouse for the most wins by a female artist in a single year um it lost album of the year but it won best new artist uh best pop performance of the year um and the song rehab wins song of the year record of the year and best female pop performance um she won best new artist uh very timely she won that uh, taylor swift was also uh, nominated to that same year so uh amy uh took the top prize there uh, over taylor swift and we know what she's been doing so you know it's unfortunate to think about you know what uh, amy winehouse uh, might have you know brought to the world because this one really good michaela rolling stone says back to black is the 33rd best album of all time um and you know it's it's really an album about uh, amy uh, exploring kind of the darkness within herself They're really in both of the albums really frank is pretty dark um as well but I, th I think frank's a little bit more talking kind of a about Amy she's talking like about herself and uh this album is a little bit more of like the view from herself uh there right. and unfortunately you know to the world she uh was lost to that darkness in 2011 at the age of 27 like a lot of our uh favorite uh most fantastic uh, artists of all time yeah really tough um I, I think it's interesting because people give a Amy Winehouse now I mean I remember Maybe it wasn't too long after her death, but people would would kind of make jokes about some of the songs that she wrote. She had this really interesting mystery about her where she would mm -hmm. get on stage. Um, she would, you know, have this, you know, really sultry, sensuous way of performing. Um, and she'd open her mouth and it would sound it would just knock your senses out. And I, she, her live performances are really special. Um, I, I uh, hadn't heard Frank as an album, but I had seen her perform uh, a couple of times on, um, on, on various, in various ways. And I was like, Ooh, this is awesome. I, and of course they were like, well, those are songs from her first album. Cause I was like, Oh, is this new stuff? And they were like, no, but um uh, she had this really amazing way of connecting with her live audience, which was really special. Um, and it's really sad to think um, what might have been uh, on this. And and some of her like livelier kind of songs like Valerie with uh, that was also produced by Mark Ronson um, that, you know, it, it it's really tough because I feel like she got so connected with, people talking about her, the inner darknesses and, and the things that she was feeling with in relation to her relationships, which also caught a lot of flack. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But after her death, I think that now it's, it's more of a, of a shrine uh, to, um, to her kind of mental mindset and the way in which, you know, you can, you can get through some of that darkness, um, which I think leads really nicely to the second half of the album because this first half is really just this deeper and darker depth of despair I feel like and the net the the first song on the second half on the b-side really starts to pick up uh and add a little bit of hope to it um and mm -hmm. I think that was definitely done by decision we talk a lot about how we um, consume these albums and talk about it on Drink the Music and and what the decisions were. Mark Ronson gave an interview um, where he said, look, some people will say it's because I produced one side and, you know, this other gentleman produced this other side, but that's not really why we did it that way. We were very purposeful and Amy was very purposeful in wanting it to be in this order. And I think that says a lot because, you know, she was just trying to find the bottom, I feel like. And, um, you know, I obviously don't know didn't, didn't know her, but I think that this was her way of trying to climb out from that uh, on the second half. 
yeah for sure yeah and it, you kind of kind of start up the second half let's go ahead and get back into the album Michaela uh, with track seven tears dry on their own and it almost is uh you know climbing out of this because you know it's literally built on you know that uh, uh Marvin Gaye song you know ain't no mountain uh high enough right that's kind of the the way the song is structured here and it's uh more of a breakup anthem right uh Amy now at this point is sounding a little bit more mature a little bit more kind of up a beat about the way that she is viewing that right he takes the day but I'm grown uh she says um it's probably Kind of the most vocal range I think we get from Amy Winehouse. She's doing a lot of like runs and uh, hitting a little bit of a higher register in here. You know, obviously you kind of kind of associate uh, Amy Winehouse with more of that uh, that alto, you know, deeper, uh, more velvety voice. But she's letting it uh, kind of fly here and uh, layer soul to bear on on you know top of uh, top of Marvin Gaye's mountain, I guess. Yeah, and I I, I really this is probably my hmm, I want to say it's my favorite. Back to Black is so amazing, but. But when I feel like I'm sad, but I'm going to be okay, this is the song I listen to because the tears might dry on their own and she might be alone, but she's going to be all right in her aloneness. And it's the only song that we hear where she thinks that that's going to be the case. Um, mm. And I kind of, I don't know, at least that's how I take it. And and I wish there was more, I wish she felt that more often. Um, maybe she'd still be here. I don't know. But um, but I love this song for that because there is there's a, this glimmer of hope. Yeah, absolutely. There's a little bit of a glimmer of hope here, um, but it, it kind of turns the page almost in a way here when we get into uh, track eight, Wake Up Alone. Uh, this song is way more, you know, raw and way more vulnerable feeling, you know, especially after Tears Dry on its own. You know, she kind of starts the song off, you know, saying I'm OK in the day because I'm staying busy. Um, the song itself is uh, super visual. Um, you know, kind of depicting this love sickness that she has. There's a lot of like liquid themes uh, in the song, uh, swimming, bathing, flooding, soaking, um, which, you know, is, you know, obviously she's tying it here to this love sickness, but I think it could also be um, some allusion, you know, to the alcohol um, and the demons that she was facing uh, there with that. Um, you know, she even has the line kind of at the front end of the song, you know, at least I'm not drinking. So, uh, yeah, I think this one, this one's real raw um, and real, real mm -hmm. vulnerable uh, sounding. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love the the allusions to liquid here because I, I feel like uh, when you are when, like in the idea of when you keep moving, it can't catch you. Right. If I keep moving, mm -hmm. um, I, I won't feel bad and staying busy. Um, you know, I don't know if she, if Amy Winehouse also had uh, an issue with alcohol. I imagine that it, those things kind of go hand in hand, but um, I definitely feel like, like this emotionally when you've been hurt and you're, you're kind of feeling destroyed by a relationship or what have you. Um, staying busy is, is what everybody tells you to do, right? Go for a run, um, you know, clean your house, uh, do, do all these things. So you don't have to worry about like, keep doing these things. Uh, so you don't have to, you know, spend all the time thinking about how horrible things are and how depressed you are. Um, but I, I do like, I, I really love at the end um, it kind of is a good juxtaposition because it starts with this incredible introduction. I really mm -hmm. love the way the song begins. And when it ends, as she's just saying, and I wake up alone and I wake up alone, it's it's it, it's really nice, like kind of a bookend mm -hmm. to the to the song ending. Right. Yeah, it's a, kind of almost uh, coming to terms, I guess, with that. Right. Uh, with. The fact that uh, this thing is uh, over and somehow so even a little bit, you know, more raw, but a little bit more, um, I guess, hopeful or um, more mature, you know, kind of like we said there about Tears Dry on their own. Uh, track number nine, Some Unholy War. This is the first song that she wrote about the uh, the breakup there with uh, Blake Fielder Civil. Um, and she states at the Glastonbury Festival that, you know, it was the first song that she wrote about it, but she didn't really know what it was about. Um, I think that the song to me, you know, most of most of like the theme of the song is like that, you know, stand, stand by your man. Right. Uh, that's a, that uh, that country trope kind of thing. And that's kind of what the song is saying to me. But I think um, really what I'm taking away from it, I think, is it's kind of her, you know, projecting that into the relationship. You know, she's really, you know, saying that that's what she's doing. But really, it's it's almost a, a cry for help that she really wished that this guy, you know, was standing you know, behind her and supporting her uh, throughout. So, you know, all of these uh, all of these bad times is was kind of the takeaway that I took from it. It's it's not really so much as she's singing about how she wants to stand by this guy. But but really, she's, you know, projecting that she wished that he would be standing by her. Yeah. And I think this is one of the saddest songs to me, um, because at first she paints it out 
uh, to be just that where, you know, he's like, what, what is an unholy war anyway? What does that actually mean? Um, you know, we get a lot of, you know, th there's a lot of context around battles, right? And like, he's going off to battle and I've got to stand here. And, um, you know. and really it's like, you know, he's, he's not actually going off to battle. He's going off to be with another person. Like what, are, right. <laughs> honey, yeah. honey, come on. Uh, you don't need no man like it's I don't know um, I, I love the way this song was constructed uh, Salam Remy uh, produced this and the, it's bass heaven I love the way it sounds but this is probably my least favorite song on the album because I feel mm, same. like yeah. this is, it's just it kind of I don't know it grosses me out I want to take a, my 12 year old self and be like look if you ever feel this way dump the dude walk away find someone else this is not the right guy walk away and i think that the entire world is shaking amy whitehouse uh you know why they're listening to this too because we all could see that he wasn't worth it Ugh. gross yeah that's right yeah she's singing about this guy right blake fielder civil and they actually would go on to get married you know later that that same year in 2007 and spend two years together before uh they'd ultimately uh get divorced um you know kind of these uh two uh <laughs> passionate bender filled years uh, so i can only could only imagine that and maybe that's what that's why i'm i'm trying to to place that she's you know projecting that on her because that's the rest of the album is definitely not about you know supporting this guy right it's about you know kind of you know dealing with her own demons and her own pain so that's a uh, summon holy war we get to track 10 he can only hold her um this one opens a very similar fashion to uh kind of one of the hits from frank valerie it has a very similar kind of a uh, opening uh little little bit to it there and the song is about being in a relationship but dwelling on the last one, you know, the one that got away um, and, you know, tries to pacify her uh, because what's inside of her never dies. Um, I really like the first, the songwriting here in the in the first verse um, says he can only hold her for so long. The lights are on, but no one's home. She's so vacant. Her soul is taken. Um, I I, I really like like that. It's um, and it pretty well documented. And, um, you know, Amy would even go on to talk about it, you know, that while she was going through this breakup there, there certainly was was no lack of other relationships that, you know, she was having during during this time, you know, same for her. And I I kind of like like I said, I like the I like the songwriting and um, kind of the. I guess the viewpoint of that, right? That, you know, even though you're going out, you're just not able to to get over the last one. And, um, you know, obviously that was something that, you know, really, um, she really struggled with, you know, through that period of her life. So. Yeah. And I really love uh, to me listening to this. I felt like it was very much uh, and this sounds sexist, perhaps, but it's something very like a man would do. Like I'm upset. So I'm going to go find a bunch of people to go and have relations with. That's how I felt about this. Um mm -hmm. Where it's, you know, I might be doing things and, and jumping into bed with other people, but at the same time, there, there is, there, make no mistake, I am broken, I am in love with someone else, I am unhappy, there, there is no relationship here, really, um, because what's inside me is love for somebody else, and that's not, that's not going away anytime soon, and so, um, I think this really, for me, was empowering in a way for for women because it was like we do that too, <laughs> we mm -hmm, do it, sure. we do it too. Everybody does this. Well, maybe not everybody, but you know, I, I really like that piece of it, um, and I thought that that was really interesting to me. Um, kind of the longingness, you you definitely feel bad for whoever she's talking about, where um, her soul is taken. He thinks, what is she running from um, now? How can he have her heart when it got stole? Like she's not even there so it's you feel really bad for this other person and it, it's a it was definitely a reminder to me in the early you know in the 2008 part of my life where it was like you know maybe just think about that because you don't want to yeah. <laughs> you you feel bad for the person so make sure you don't you be kind to other people's hearts don't do that to somebody else you know yeah for sure um yeah and that's you know kind of a theme that you got uh you know earlier in the album right of her you know, being with other people and, you know, but not being, you know, fully there or, you know, that, you know, she wasn't, she wasn't really in it for love. Right. And she kind of knew that she was going to hurt these people, but you know, that was uh, a coping mechanism, I guess, maybe in some sort of way. Um, and that gets us to track 11 addicted. So this wasn't on the original uh, U S release edition. So I'd actually, I don't, I don't know that I'd ever heard the song really until I just listened to it uh, the other day um, uh, on the, on the iTunes version. Mm -hmm. I wanted to listen kind of the, the regular, because the, the vinyl record I have is the U S version. So it has like a, a remix of, you know, I'm, 
I'm no good uh, on that one. So Addicted, um, it's a song basically about weed, <laughs> pretty much, uh, to be quite honest. Uh, it's super well written, though, uh, from from that standpoint, as as far as songs about weed go, this is a this is a pretty good one. Pretty good. Um, I think that it feels a little out of place in contrast to the rest of the album, because the rest of the album is basically, you know, about her breakup with that with that guy. Um, but I do kind of a appreciate it from the stance that it's like kind of this like little like bookend like circular bits you know so you have rehab um on the front you have addicted uh, on the back and you know kind of i guess kind of at the end of the end of the day uh the takeaway here from the album is you know despite losing this guy um like i said they do, you know eventually go on to get married but you know despite losing this guy um you know amy just like the rest of us had her vices that she did i'm I, I agree with you. I, this was not my favorite ending. I do love the outro to the song. I think it is. I think it is really nice. Um, I, I read somewhere when I was doing research for this, that there were cases to be made that, hey, you know, Back to Black probably should have been at the end. I disagree. I, I really like kind of where it is uh, in the mm -hmm. album, even though I think for sure it's the pinnacle song. Um, this one, I don't know. I, I kind of wish um, and and. And I'm listening. I listened to this on, on Apple uh, Music, so uh, this was in it. It, I, but I almost feel like it. It's a it's a land yap. It's kind of an afterthought. I mean, it's it's all right. It's it's one of it's not my favorite song. It's good. It's really good. But I just I don't know how I felt about it in context with the whole album and how it fit. Um, I wanted something a little bit more. Back to Blackie. Basically, I really wanted to hear Back to Black twice is probably what I'm trying to say, okay. Okay. Um, because I think that that would have been I, I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's a good song, though. I mean, I do like it. Um, I, I think it's almost though. it. I don't know. I don't know if I like it now that, you know, because Amy Winehouse has passed and, um, and, and she died of a drug overdose. So I don't know if the last song on the last album uh, and, and I don't know who decided to add to have this be the last song on the last album because it wasn't originally right. I don't know. That doesn't. Well, it was. It was originally great. on the on the UK version. It was just not was here it? on the US version. Not here. Yeah, okay. So it was, it was originally Got it. on there. Um, I think. I think for myself, I probably would have just went ahead and uh, ended it after track ten. He can only hold her. Just let that be the end. I think that maybe that would have been, uh, been the better call, but. But yeah, I think on one hand, right, you get you can look at it that way, or you can look at it and be like, oh, well, here's another song from Amy Winehouse that maybe we never would have gotten because you know at the time you don't know that this is going to be uh, the last and uh, final album from her. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, it is like you said, um, Michaela passed away um, in 2011. You know, far too young uh, at the age of 27. Um, and there's uh, there's a lot of articles you can read kind of about you know the the quote unquote 27 club as uh people like to call it and it you know it speaks you know kurt cobain and Jimi hendrix and brian jones janice joplin jim morrison um amy winehouse you know um in that group now too but i think why these uh, artists and musicians um resonate so much and so deeply with people you know you think of you know uh, janice joplin you think of you know kurt cobain you think of um jim morrison kind of in that way is they're so like vulnerable and raw they allow people to sort of it's kind of like kind of like a safe space then for people to you know play with those kind of inner demons that they have within themselves um and they can project a lot of that onto that and that's you know a, a tremendous burden uh you know for these artists uh to bear and you know unfortunately you know that burden just gets to be uh too much you know in, in the case of these um musicians here so i wanted to to kind of mention that there but um michaela you mentioned you know kind of you know going out uh you know rehab becomes this this club anthem that i assume then i guess was the the first kind of experience that you had with uh amy winehouse did you have other like ongoing things had you ever listened to this album before um for the you know the sake of the podcast or had you were you just familiar you know kind of with those hits from that or i i was definitely familiar with the hits i think i'd listened to the album a couple of times um it's to me it's a good getting ready to to go out kind of album it's really good for um kind of kind of background music because some of the songs kind of run together in this thematic way in which we've been talking about for the last few minutes but um i had never really just sat down and like tried to absorb uh, this album before, except for the sake of the podcast. And I'm really glad I did. Um, I, I have much more of an appreciation for the album. I mean, it, it, it definitely moved me in a different way. Um, and again, it goes back to how we 
listen to music, right? Um, mm-hmm. Thinking about these and and listening to the lyrics and the songs and, and the layers upon layers. And, and it's really a, an easy listen. This is only a 35 minute album front to back, um, mm-hmm. which is pretty, which is pretty impressive. We it's it, it that it packs so much emotion, so much musicality in these 11 songs. And in such a short amount of time uh, really speaks to the talent uh, that, that, that we're listening to and not just with Amy, but the, the, atta- the, the talent of the, the, the band and the, the, kind of the musical layering and, and creation and the production production of the album itself um, is really impressive to me. Um, I remember very distinctly hearing Rehab and being like, oh my God, it's everywhere. Wasn't a huge fan of it. Thought it was okay. I thought, you know, I was, you know, I'm a dare kid. So I was like, I don't know. It's a song about drugs. I don't know. I remember being shook when I heard black, Back to Black on the radio, I was driving uh, back from lunch. I was driving to my office and the song came on and I pulled into the parking garage and cried. <laughs> I do remember that very distinctly. And I was like, oh my God, who is this Amy Winehouse? And so then of course I became a little obsessed and, uh, you know, this was back, it, you know, this is in the early 2000. So you couldn't just go and like download all of her stuff. So, um, so, uh, you know, trying to find it and hear it again on the radio that I, I won't forget that. And so thank you, Amy, for doing that. That was awesome. We miss you. We wish you were still here. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Amy. We do wish you were uh, still here, but we do have uh, these two albums from her to, uh, to kind of celebrate and, um, you know, ex- explore, um, you know, these, these themes with her. Um, and yeah, that's, that's one of the things, um, not going to belabor the point too much, but that's kind of one of the things, um, you know, about listening to an album as opposed to, you know, just, just the song, because it gives it a lot more depth of meaning, right? So you can listen to rehab and, you know, it's, it's kind of this, this club hit, right? It's about, you know, like, like you said, Miguel, you were, you were a dare kid, not, not into, not into drugs. So, you know, this, so this is really kind of missing the mark, but then when you listen to it, you know, and, um, you know, it, it folds into the next song and, and it starts to give some more depth to you know the song rehab and you know kind of what those lyrics are trying to say and how they how these songs kind of piggyback off of each other and uh, it really is just a beautiful exploration of you know that 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 darker aspect of the mind of um amy winehouse there and unfortunately lost too soon uh to the world so uh that is it that is amy amy winehouse's uh 2006 back to black it's a fantastic album it's uh like michaela said it's short so definitely go give it a listen and uh you know while you're doing it you know pay honor to uh, Amy Winehouse and uh, try yourself the Rick's C cocktail. Uh, it was a uh, it was a good one. It was interesting. It was uh, neat to do a little bit of a, a deep dive and you know kind of see what made Amy Winehouse tick here in terms of uh, looking up these cocktails in this uh, pub that she would frequent uh, throughout her life. So uh, try that out. Let us know. Let us know what you think about Amy Winehouse and uh, let us know. Um, I don't know. Let us let us know what your experience was uh, with Amy Winehouse. If you ever uh, caught her in concert or, um, you know, listen to these albums, uh, if you like Frank, which one you like better, you know, let us know all that stuff. You can do that on our social medias. It's at to drink the movies on Instagram and X and threads and blue sky and Facebook.com slash drink the movies. Uh, you can go to our Patreon, patreon.com slash drink the movies. That's where we have uh, polls up to uh, vote for our next album. We get extra bonus cocktails. We just talked about uh, Taylor Swift era's tour movie last week. So go check that out. It's patreon.com slash drink the movies and go to our website www.drinkthemovies.com that's where we have uh, episode recaps pictures of our cocktails the recipes uh, all the movies and music we've ever covered we've got drink the video game stuff on there we've got all the stuff so go check out the website and make sure you get subscribed to the podcast michaela where can they do that you can find us on apple Podcasts, spotify um we are on iHeartRadio. we're on good pods pretty much uh if you're listening to us right now we're we're on that we're on we're on your rectangle somewhere i promise and uh but that's anywhere where spotify podcasts are distributed and supported we appreciate that um if you're liking what you're hearing uh and i'm really hoping that you are uh please press the subscribe button we do two drops a week we have our lobby bar which is always lots of fun and then our deep dives of either movies or music right now we're focused on music due to the sag actress strike so um I'm really enjoying that. Uh, we love our our fans. We love our listeners. If you uh, join us on our Discord, we can talk about all things cocktails uh, and music and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, you know, liking us, putting a five star review, telling your friends about us, sharing our stuff on social media it really helps us uh, build the community and get all of the drink, the mu- music, movie stuff out there. And we are so grateful. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's going to wrap it up here for Amy Winehouse's uh, Back to Black. And um, in, in light of the, the episode here, I um, want to make mention if you're uh, having any troubles, make sure you seek out some help. We'll put some resources in the show notes and a uh, link also to the Amy Winehouse Foundation, uh, which does a, a lot of uh, really good work for uh, young women. So check those out. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll talk to you next time on Drink, Drink the, the Music. She had the most amazing voice. She had a pretty amazing voice. Rest in peace, Amy. <laughs>